I'm reposting a long video that I made some time ago where I looked at the various prohibitions uh, that are cited by people on the internet against homosexuality from the Bible. Uh, essentially, there's prohibitions that are identified in Leviticus 18, 22, 20, 13, for example. The Genesis, the, ref the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, Deuteronomy 23, um, which talks really about shrine prostitution. And then in the New Testament, uh, St. Paul's letters to Romans, uh, chapter 1, 26 to 27, um, Corinthians, chapter 6, 1 Corinthians, and 1 Timothy, 1, 9 to 10. I also went on to talk later, and I'm not sure I will, um, I, I will have time to put all this in, about the prohibitions of homosexuality in the Quran in Surah Al-Araf, Surah ash Shua and Surah Al-Nami, An-Nami, sorry. And again, while these are, while these all seem clear, they are quite evasive and they rely heavily, um, uh, people who quote these rely heavily on very specific hadiths and traditions that are, again, quite... Um, uh, quite prejudiced and have have emerged after the main text was um, promulgated. So there is room for revision and when I was looking into all this I certainly identified uh, two gay mosques and a number of gay churches that they, if they were able to get around and uh, and, and to negotiate these um, verses, then it struck me that the verses were not as um, strident and as uh, demonstrative as some people think they might be. Uh, the the, um, the the biblical verses certainly, I am I am confident they don't mean what a lot of rather nasty and primarily evangelical Christians uh, understand and correction is necessary. And similarly, I think the wider spirit of Islam is about acceptance and inclusion. It's not about exclusion. And I, I think it's important to put these uh, verses into context. So I say, Surah Al-Araf, Surah Ash, Shu'ara, Surah An-Nami. And I, I, if I don't get a chance to go into those fully, um, I, I, w I will do so in a later video. <laughs> This is a film about the prohibition of homosexuality and the way the Bible has been used to support such a prohibition. What I want to look at today are the six verses that condemn homosexuality in the Bible. Six. That's six verses out of a total of 31,000 odd with the Old Testament and the New Testament combined. If we go to Genesis to start with, and we look at the creation story. After each act of creation, God looks at what he's done and says, it is good, it is very good. And then he creates man. And he says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will find him a suitable partner. The traditions of Orthodox Judaism, Orthodox Christianity, Catholicism, some of the evangelical churches, would say that this verse is appropriate to heterosexual men, but not to homosexual or gay men or people. It is appropriate for gay people to be alone. The Catholic Church is very precise about it. It's perfectly legitimate to be homosexual, but not to do anything about it. So homosexuality contains within it the demand for celibacy. I think this is not necessarily what the writer of Genesis 
had in mind when he records God as saying, it is not right for man to be alone. Let's look at the first of these six verses. Genesis chapter 19. Now, popular literature sees this universally as a condemnation of homosexuality, but it may not be exactly that. Certainly, 2,000 years ago, the sin of Sodom was not seen as homosexuality. It was seen by Jesus, for example, as inhospitality. It was seen by Ezekiel as arrogance. The story is set as a parallel between the hospitality of Abraham to the three angels and the inhospitality of the people of Sodom who crowd around the doorway um, while Lot is, um, is entertaining the angels and say, bring out your guests. We want to have our wicked way with them. Now, some traditions say it's not just the men of Sodom who are standing around the house, but all the people, women and children as well. And what they have in mind is a form of gang rape. Now, this is not quite what we understand as homosexuality. This is much closer to what was recorded happening in Abu Ghraib, a form of ritual humiliation, a war code. So this story, which seems so clear and is so embedded in our consciousness and our literature, is not as clear as in fact it first appeared. Let's go on to the next two prohibitions, which we find in Leviticus, the Hebrew text, the Ish, Asher, Yishkav, Etzaka. It's not good for a man to lie with a man, Mishkve Isha, like a woman. To Eva, it's an abomination. Asu, Shnehem, Mot, Yumatu, Demechem, Bam. The condemnation is death and blood. It's quite serious. And the word lie here. When you look at the Septuagint, the word in Greek is arsenos. Arsenos is linked to a word which we find in 1 Timothy, which again is important when we look at the New Testament. Arsenokitis. It's a word which only appears there, but it obviously has its origin. The etymology goes back to the Septuagint, to this translation of this verse. So this is a very important verse, a very important statement. Do not lie with a man as with a woman. Now, this verse occurs in a section of the Bible which is dealing with ritual purity. Ritual purity is very important because today we think about the individual time of the Bible, our thoughts are about the community, preserving the purity of the community, community responsibility. What an individual d does can damage the reputation and the good standing of the community. Now, let's look at, at why I question this today. First of all, the Council of Jerusalem in AD 49, made a decision that the rules of the Jewish tradition were no longer relevant to modern Christianity. So we could say, at this point, ah yes, this particular verse is completely irrelevant to the Christian outlook. Of course, we have to be very careful with this cherry-picking idea and with this, ah, it's not relevant, because just a few lines beyond this prohibition is the statement, you should love your neighbour as yourself. Leviticus 19, verse 18. And this Jesus quotes as being the summary of the law and the prophets. So Jesus obviously was looking at this text. So you can't say, ah oh, yes, we're going to get this bit, we're not going to get this bit. We're going to keep this, we're going to lose that. You have to be very careful about the cherry-picking motives. My second question of the text is to ask whether these texts fully address what we regard as homosexual or gay behaviour today. And the evidence suggests that what is at issue is something else, a form of pagan ritual, activity unlikely to be part 
of the life of modern gay people. My third question is about identity, which is never addressed. A number of sexual practices seem to be condemned in the Bible, but not everyone who is gay would participate in these activities. There are assumptions that the biblical texts clearly condemn homosexuality. And this, or these assumptions, lie behind much opposition to gay marriage. But the texts, I hope, I demonstrate, are ambiguous. If anybody understands this text, it must be the people who live with it today, the Jewish community. So we need to look at the Jewish traditions around this verse, or these two verses. And we find the, these in the Talmud, the interpretation, the texts uh, which are collected um, of what the rabbis have said, how they have debated these verses. Now, the first thing that we have to do is to say that the rabbis are looking at actions, not, um, not sentiment. So there's no condemnation of being gay in the Talmud. And indeed, in the Bible, there's no condemnation of lesbianism. It is condemned in the Talmud. As the Talmud says, lesbianism is just another aspect of uh, the abominations of the foreigners, the activity of the people in Egypt. Let's jump a little bit here to the story of King Josiah. King Josiah, recorded in 2 Kings, Chapter 23, verse 7, cleanses the temple. And one of the things that he cleanses is the male prostitutes. Male prostitutes? It's not always translated as that because sometimes the translations are a little bit coy. In Hebrew, Kaddish. The passive male prostitutes. If, 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 if you're suspicious about this, you need to look at one of the first Christian um, historians Eusebius, because Eusebius says this tradition continues in um, Lebanon until the 4th century. So this is what is condemned. What is condemned is a form of cultic sexual practice. Perfectly reasonable to see that as a condemnation. It's not necessarily a condemnation of the homosexual, of the gay person. It's a condemnation of a particular activity which in turn is linked to some form of condemned activity which is pagan. Now, let's go on a little bit further before we pause for a moment and, 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 and then move on to the arguments in the New Testament. How does modern Judaism deal with homosexuality? Well, of course, Judaism, like Christianity, divides into different traditions, a very orthodox tradition and a much more liberal or reformed tradition. The liberal and reformed tradition often accept gay people. The more orthodox tradition can often appear quite negative, quite homophobic. But even when we look at somebody from the Hasidic tradition, somebody from the very extreme orthodox traditions of Judaism, like the um, uh, Lubavitcher Rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he, he comes up with a great line. We, we must consider who you are rather than what you do. And the chief rabbi would say something similar. He would emphasize compassion. Uh, Shmuley Boter, who has a background in Lubavitch, um, recently urged people who were taking a more extreme uh, opinion of, uh, for example, condemning gay marriage, you should be careful about how they talk to the wider community and how they promote uh, their opinions. So what, what we see, even from an orthodox Jewish position, is a desire for caution. Uh, the, 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 there's a nice um, uh, idea called the driving teshuva. Teshuva means penance, sorrow. And the driving teshuva is about um, effectively turning a blind eye to those who are driving on the Sabbath. Now, the Jewish law is a community responsibility. So what somebody else is doing, you, 
it's difficult to say. Okay, get on with your get on with it yourself. What one person does could be seen to cause offence or harm or or to compromise the rest of the community. The idea of individuality is a modern idea. The ideas that which we find in the Judaism of Leviticus are ideas of preserving the community, the purity of the community. The driving tshuva says, ah yes, but there are certain times when it is necessary to drive. It's necessary if you live too far away from your synagogue. It is necessary if you want to go to the synagogue to drive. If you are gay, it is necessary to act on this instinct. There is no choice. Where there is no choice, it cannot be necessarily wrong to cherry-pick. To recap so far, the three texts we have looked at are ambiguous, and the people with most right to interpret them urge caution. Since I recorded the first part of this talk, there's been a lot of activity in the media. First, there was the ridiculous uh, British politician who said that natural disasters were to be blamed on the legalisation here of gay marriage. Then there was the impassioned speech, uh, the brilliant speech, by the Irish celebrity Panty Bliss. And finally, of course, uh, there was always the furore around the Sochi games and the discovery that President Putin has gay friends and likes the music of Elton John. So, this subject seems relevant. Too many bigots appeal to the Bible, to scripture, to defend their impossible views. I'm afraid my suspicion is that these same bigots don't even read the Bible for anything else. It, it can be a proof text to defend the most obnoxious and um, short-sighted positions. The Bible has been used erroneously, um, for example, to defend slavery, the abuse of women, uh, genocide, anti-Semitism. Well, there's a great deal, sadly, that can be said about that. And crusades. These people who appeal to the Bible to promote homophobia are in very peculiar Company, I hope this series of talks will make these people, these bigots, pause before they invoke texts that they do not fully understand to justify their continued and appalling views. In the first part of this talk, we looked at the three Old Testament texts in their historical context and in the way that modern Judaism interprets them. We noted the link between homosexuality and pagan religious cults, and also um, unattractive forms of warfare, a form of torture, an Abu Ghraib type of um, activity. So successful was the campaign of the Jewish writers to eradicate these abuses from their society that what we have left are some curious texts that can today be misunderstood we must think of them like a jeweller who takes a precious diamond from one ring and places it in another. It's still the same precious stone, but its original context has been lost, and these texts similarly have been isolated by history. To add more metaphors, they are the orphans abandoned by successful parents. We need now to be cautious and kind when we come to dealing with them. When we come to the New Testament, we again find aspects of the debate that are linked to paganism. We've got three quotations again. Uh, Romans 1, verses 26 to 27. Now here, what Paul is looking at is a condemnation of something which is unnatural. But he uses the word natural or unnatural in other contexts. He uses it, for example, in 1 Corinthians about hair length which presumably is something that we don't take that seriously today. Christians found themselves in an environment where they were uh, challenged by mystery cults and by the exploitation of slaves. This is not our world, and the admonitions must again be seen and qualified by a cultural context that has passed. Modern scholarship has gone much further, and in looking at Romans 1, 26 to 27, 
we can approach this in four different ways. We can follow the bigots and say that this verse or these verses clearly condemn homosexuality as unnatural. But these verses were not universally interpreted in this way through history. The early fathers of the church are focused on cultic emasculation, not homosexuality, even as late as Erasmus in the 16th century. And we must never forget the anathemas at the beginning of Lenten orthodoxy that still damn Origen, who took Matthew 19.12 too literally and castrated himself. What seems so obvious today to the bigot was not so obvious to someone 1,500 years ago. Why do the early church fathers not take full advantage of these verses in Romans? And we know that some of them, for example, St. John Chrysostom, were elsewhere quite deeply homophobic. If they don't use these verses for that purpose, then maybe that's not how they were intended to be used. There's nothing new about homophobia. So why this change? I think this first approach must be mistaken. Let's call it the traditional approach. Let's get back to my four approaches to the Roman text. We've had the traditional or fundamental approach which is marred by inconsistent interpretation and indeed by issues about the authority of the actual text that we use. Let's recap. What seems like universal condemnation of gay behaviour is actually a modern post-reformation view that is not supported wholly by the early church fathers. So it's not traditional. Now, secondly, we should look at the context of these verses. We can say, well, hmm, Paul is actually giving us a history lesson. Paul is telling us about what was in the past. So we can't automatically draw conclusions about what is in the past and bring them into the present, because he's talking about this great change that happens with the advent of Christianity. Christ eradicates the law and re-establishes union with God uh, through the atonement or through the, the lovely idea of theosis. Now, theosis says that with the fall, man and God are separated. With the incarnation, Christ shows us the way of reunion with God. Uh, to quote St. Athanasius, God became man, that man may become divine. Since God and sin cannot coexist, to paraphrase Aquinas, when God became man, sinful, fallen human nature is transformed. Everything Christ touched becomes, in some way, godly again. Creation is renewed. So we have a new opportunity to connect to the divine through the incarnation of Christ. Our actions as human beings are transformed by God's love. God's love is most perfectly expressed in the Trinity, a series of reciprocal relations. And we aspire in our human relationship to such reciprocity. Of course, there can be selfishness, prostitution, but in a proper loving relationship, surely either straight or gay, we are participating in the transfigured life, and our nature itself is transformed. In the next section, my third approach to Romans 1, 26 to 27, I shall look at the idea of nature itself, what it means. And then, in the fourth section, I will look at a revolutionary approach to these verses. We've looked at two approaches to Romans 1, 26 to 27. Now, the third approach to Romans 1, 26 to 27 will be more complex and will divide into a number of different sections. We can nitpick about what the word natural or unnatural actually means. I mean, it's unnatural to wear spectacles. It's unnatural to use an iPhone. It's unnatural to write on a computer. It's unnatural to drive in a car. It's unnatural to make a video like this. Um, Dorothy L. Sayers uh, questions nature. She, uh, she, 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 she tells a rather wonderful detective story um, where the resolution is about the fact that uh, horses 
can be naturally gay. So can giraffes and so on. So to appeal to nature is a very troubling appeal. Uh, in this case, some people have said that the word natural actually means what is natural for me. Uh, so we're talking about heterosexual people who indulge in homosexual behavior as a sort of experiment, some sort of dodgy degenerate dogging. Not something really we want to encourage and certainly not the basis of a loving relationship. Uh, unnatural um, activity uh, in the church fathers would include things like gluttony. But nobody's saying that we shouldn't have a meal occasionally. It may be in addition to do with cultic behavior, to do with some primitive mystery cult. Remember, Paul is writing his letter to the Romans from Corinth. Now, Corinth is the center of a celebrated Bacchic cult, which had initiation rites involving gay rape, even in the second century AD, according to Pausanias, the geographer. And this same cult was famous for a major Roman scandal described in a book by Livy. And Paul knew his Livy because Paul steals the metaphor of the one body and the many parts from Livy. It's certainly possible that when Paul talks of unnatural gay sex, he refers to cultic activity and some sort of cultic activity that got out of control. He says that men received in their own persons, this is the Romans uh, chapter 1, verse 26, uh, verse 27. Men received in their own person the penalty for their error. Well, we know that when Paul is particularly uh, excited, he can be really quite funny as well. And I wonder if this might be a Pauline joke for buggery. What is more useful, I think, is to try to unravel the actual meaning of this verse, because it is so extraordinary. Let's see the verse itself. It seems fairly straightforward until we see the context. And remember, the context is everything, because this is a historical statement by Paul, and it begins at verse 18 with the Greek word gar, which is a rhetorical signal in Greek that your adversary or your enemy is speaking. So what Paul is actually saying is, Romans, this is what you've heard from other people, and now I'm going to propose something new. This is the new situation. What he will say is that with the advent of Christ, I am introducing a new approach to what you have heard of as natural and unnatural. But it is not even this simple, because Paul has drawn a distinction between the two groups of offenders. The greater penalty, death, I think is reserved for that list of people who are described in verse 28. While those involved in idolatry and homosexuality only suffer bodily indignity, and that is their penalty. It would be, I think, a fairly unfair system if people were punished twice for the same offence. The sins listed in the second section are all, with the exception of God-haters, to do with our relationship with one another. At this point we should remember Christ's golden rule, love one another as yourself, love your neighbour as yourself. The sins described in verse 28 precisely defy that rule. And the sinners, Paul says, deserve to die. So, now, let's come to the fourth way of looking at this verse in its context. And this is a revolutionary thing. It's new. We need to begin by looking at another verse in Romans in the next chapter, chapter 2, verses 26 to 27. And these verses are equally difficult to unravel, but the key to understanding them lies in a short analysis by Photius, or Saint Photius. I have to thank Dr. Bill Berg for his translation. Photius was an Archbishop and Patriarch of Constantinople, and he's perhaps most known for beginning the Photian Schism which was about the insertion of the word filioque, one word in Latin, filioque and the sun. Uh, this was one word which Photius said was inserted into the Nicene Creed, uh, I believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father, filioque and the Son. The Western Church claimed that it was omitted by the East from the Nicene Creed, uh, so there was a lot of fuss about this. Now, Photius also identifies 
St. Augustine as one of the sources of the filioque idea. And for this reason, Augustine is treated very warily by the Eastern churches. And things like, uh, for example, the inherited guilt of original sin are not part of Eastern Christian thought. The whole issue is dealt with in a short book published last year by Michael Woods. What Photius does is to draw attention to a distinction in the Jewish law between two different types of law. What he calls jobs and justices. He, the, the, the term justice uh, here is um, taken from Jerome's translation of the word um, justitiae in the Vulgate. And Luke, for example, identifies these two aspects of the law in chapter 1 verse 6 when he's talking about Zechariah and his wife who keep all the jobs and justices of the law. Essentially, it is only the latter group, the justices, which remain significant for the church. In chapter 2, Photius draws attention to Paul's idea that the Gentile can also keep the law. But it is the justices, ta dikaiomata to nomu, that Paul is talking about. These are part of the new law of Christ, the kingly law to love your neighbour. And Paul places the issue of homosexuality within the former group, as we saw in Romans 1.28. Those sins which receive bodily punishment, but do not deserve spiritual death. But I think we can go a little bit further. The mystical union with Christ, the communion of the church, to use Livy's phrase, the new body, what will later be called theosis, uh, means that we have acquired in Christ a new nature. This means we no longer have to keep a tally of those laws we follow and those laws we break. In this new nature with Christ, everybody should be moving towards perfection. There are ideals. Christ calls us to perfection. That's the standard. And Paul thinks that chastity is one of these ideals. And if you can't aspire to that, then marriage is just as good, he says. And if he had been asked, I'm sure he would have said a gay relationship is just as good. Because the cultic laws and the symbolic uh, rituals no longer apply in the new life in Christ. If it doesn't frighten the horses, Paul might say, it's okay. For example, he condones slavery in the letter to Philemon. And he is not willing to promote the sort of change in the role of women in Roman society that we expect and regard as proper today. He is not ushering in social chaos, a revolution. Instead, he is expecting the whole of Christian society to move together towards perfection. This means that Paul accepts the norms of behaviour in society if they are restructured within the framework of the kingly law to love one another. It's an attitude rather than a revolution. Though sexual exploitation cannot be part of this new life. Chastity may be the ideal, but a loving relationship, whether straight or gay, must be a fair compromise. Essentially, this approach absolutely transforms our understanding of St. Paul. Whereas with the Old Testament texts, we drew the conclusion that we had ambiguity but compassion, with the New Testament texts now, with the idea of the new law of Christ to love one another, the language of condemnation is absolutely wrong, particularly when we are looking at people who show no malice towards others. Now, I need to look at the other two texts that deal with homosexuality in Paul's letters. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and in 1 Timothy 1, 10, we're looking at this peculiar word, arsenakitis, and it's been translated as abuse, as homosexuality, but in, 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 in fact, this word is very difficult to translate. If we see it in the context of the Old Testament prohibition, then what we're looking at is probably a form of prostitution. And that certainly is not something we want to encourage. Economic exploitation. Something 
to be regretted both for the person who is forced into prostitution and indeed for the person who is paying for it. We can quibble about the precise meaning of the word arsenokites, but if you read on in 1 Corinthians 6.11, Paul says, Such were some of you, but you were washed and sanctified in the name of Christ. Again, nature is transformed, and the old approach to cataloguing a series of offences against jobs and justices is gone. We live in a new age of theosis, and all creation is in the process of of change. There are some positive images in the Bible of homosexuality, but you have to look hard. There's Naomi and Ruth. There's David and Jonathan in 1 Samuel. There's the centurion's servant. This is something which is being emphasized very much at the moment. The centurion's servant, referred to as a boy, Pais. And um, Jesus uh, cures the centurion's servant because of the centurion's appeal. Jesus certainly was not being prejudiced. If indeed the word servant is a euphemism for lover. Now the word Malachi in 1 Corinthians 6, 9. It's seen a shift in meaning. If you look at classical Greek parallels, it means stupidity or weakness. So it's a synonym for raka, the Aramaic word used in Matthew 5.22. Over the early Christian period, this word takes on a sexual meaning. So by the time of John the Faster, in the 6th century, it literally means masturbation. And it retains this meaning, technically, in modern Greek, though it's also used on the street corner as a synonym equally for stupidity. What Paul intends this word to mean is simply not clear. He may just use it as a term to mean weak or hedonistic or foolish. Jesus and Paul came from the same linguistic milieu, and this of course differs from that of Attic, classical Greek. So it's likely that they would have used words in the same way, and there's enough evidence to suggest that not only Paul but Jesus too was familiar with Greek as well as Aramaic. Jesus, after all, was um, a child only two or three miles away from the biggest Roman garrison in that area of the Mediterranean. So, if we take raka to mean fool and malachi means fool, if we take malachi to mean gay, then raka equally means gay, and Jesus is very clear in Matthew 5.22 that calling people raka, gay, will have nasty consequences. Is Jesus condemning gay bashing? If you look at Matthew 11.8, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist, and he says, why do you go to see him? To see a man in soft clothes? It, it, it's speculation, but here again, is Jesus saying that John the Baptist had a reputation for being gay. Are you going off to see this man who looks a bit effeminate, is a bit soft, wears strange clothes? Let's return to that verse we looked at at the beginning in Genesis, where God says, it's not good for man to be alone, let's make him a helper. And when we look at what Jesus says about marriage, that a man leaves his parents and becomes one body with his spouse. Now what Jesus is talking about here is commitment, not gender identity. So it would be wrong to take this verse as a statement that Jesus is condemning homosexual relationships. Jesus is promoting commitment. Over all this, maybe we should bear in mind one verse from, a, from the Christian part of the Bible, from the New Testament, in Acts 10, 28, because we've already looked at this um, particular um, story in the context of dismissing Leviticus. This is, uh, this is a story that leads to the Council of Jerusalem, and it's about um, the dream, and God tells us not to consider any man 
impure or unclean. So maybe the great command is for compassion. There are prohibitions, but they have to be looked at very carefully and cautiously. And while we have caution, we should also have compassion and respect for one another.